country in 2006. Edition 19, first place, Elder Shabbat Women. Right? Yeah. Edition 20, first place, Elder Shabbat Women. Okay. Edition 21, first place, Variety Show Women. What's that? A 3 P. We scribe for perfection every day, even when hard tasks. Come on, wait! Our brotherhood is our pride. It's what we do. It's not about me, and it's not about you. We work together to be the best, and our hearts ready to be put to the test. We are Peerless Perfection!
Hello, everyone. I want to thank you all for coming out to engage in this conversation with us today. Um, it's Divided States by Charlie Palmer, and the discussion is us, them, and resistance. And it's very timely. Uh, 50 years ago, there was a Kerna Commission report uh, for, done for President Lyndon B. Johnson. And this was in 1968 when there was a lot of rioting going on after the Civil Rights Movement. This report was completed in about seven months, and the findings of the report was that we were growing into two different Americas, one black, one white, one separate, and one unequal. And Charlie's show is pretty aligned with that message. And those are pretty much the things that we're going to talk about today. So again, I thank y'all for joining us. So I want to introduce first Charlie Palmer. Yeah. Tracy Morell, who is the coordinator, the coordinator and curator of this show. Onaji Henderson, who is a gallerist, and he represents Charlie's work. And Rihanna Brown, who is a youth activist. Right in, and I want to start with Tracy. Oh, okay. yes. uh, as the curator of this work, I want you to share with us the role and how important it was for you to curate this work in this space. Oh, wow. That's a great question. Um, I've been very fortunate to watch the development of this work. Charlie and I share. Uh, our studios are in the same building and we're across from each other and we're usually there almost every day. So particularly in the silent series, I watched it um, from just a couple of sketches to where uh, Charlie quickly, you know, just was like on a roar. Just every time I come in, it was like a new painting and he had made the decision that he wanted to go in a different direction, explore other things. So he wanted to have an exhibition here. He specifically, actually he started talking to me about having an exhibition here last year. Mm -hmm. um, it was very important that he had his work shown in this space. And so I was able to, um, we started a conversation about it last year. And we were gonna show just, um, um, we we're gonna pull from different series. And then uh, once it was confirmed for here, at this space, he started working on the silent series which kind of gave shape and direction um, to what the exhibition would be focused on. I mean, all of his work is tied together, but that one's the most powerful. So it's, um, you know, the universe kind of, you put out what you want and the universe delivers. Okay. He was very clear on what he wanted. Um, I heard that, I got my instructions <laughs> and um, everything just fell into place. It was like one of the most effortless exhibitions I've curated. Um, part of it is because I'm so familiar with the work and I'm a huge fan of, of his process and his work and his messaging uh -huh. and I'm a huge fan of this gallery space. It's very, it's underutilized, it's kind of one of Atlanta's hidden jewels um, and everything just happened because it was supposed to. You started with, you started with America Was mm -hmm. and you ended with 7-8. 1335B, which is, America Was, if anyone's seen it, is the Mamie image, and it ends with uh, an inmate. And can you tell us the, your motivation behind that? Um, one thing that uh, I love about his work is that it's multi-generational, and, it's, it, and it, it talks about our history as, as African Americans in this country through different decades. So starting with um, America Was and the themes that, can, that are threaded throughout his work, 
um, I felt starting there, because he chose what he wanted to be um, the, the title exhibition, which was Distraction, and I paired it with America, the, um, America Was, because it shows kind of our history and where we are currently and how it's, it, the story hasn't changed all that much. Now, with um, uh, the piece that I end with, um, there's a couple decisions there that, that um, went into that one. One is the color palette was a little different. So I felt that it needed its own space. Um, and then the message is so integral to an issue that's not being ad addressed enough and resolved in our, um, um, that America is not addressing well, which is the institutionalization of black bodies. Right. Um, and I wanted that to be, regardless when we, we, we talk about, uh, and we see all the different themes that he talks about, you know, from black love to civil rights, to family, to unity, to inequity, to our, our, our history. Um, can't forget, I want, when you leave, you, that's something that stays on your mind that, yeah. We, that's an issue that so much more work needs to be done on. You did a good job. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, this exhi exhibition, Divided States, is, as your friend and a, a consumer of art, is easily your best work from where I stand. And I just want to tell you that I'm proud of you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> but um, the work shows a, signific a significant shift, the silent series at least, uh, in aesthetic and style and narrative. I feel like it's a departure from what most people can identify your work and your name with. And you know, the formula has changed from my eye and the message, the politics. Can you share what, your, what the impetus was behind that shift, if there was anything? Um, For me, it was. I, I suppose there was, there was a shift, because I've been wanting to, for the last couple of years, just do almost traditional paintings, um, celebrating the, the, the black body, the, the black people. What I, always admired and appreciated about Charles White was the, the narrative of just a portrait or a drawing of beautiful black people. And so uh, I've been trying to explore that a little bit and uh, was also playing with a technique of working in black, white, and grays. And I had created a piece of uh, Khalif Browder uh, from, from New York, and it's his tragic story. And every time I looked at that, that portrait, it was missing something. And I couldn't figure out what it was because I was trying to say something that a portrait in itself could not do. And so I just happened to have some star stencils in my studio. And so I put the stars across his mouth to kind of represent silence and then put a couple of red stripes and realized that I had created something different or new. Um, when it comes to the narrative, I, I think my narrative has have, have probably been the same for a long time. Um, I can't seem to depart from it because it's so important as an artist to, for me, to be saying something social and to acknowledge, identify, celebrate blackness. And so that's what I've always been doing. I think with this one, it was really about trying to acknowledge young people for the importance of being an American and the idea that uh, don't let anyone intimidate you and take your voice away because as an American, it's, it's your right. And so when I saw the, the Browder and I had created that piece, I had an aha moment. Uh, so I went back to the subject of, of cabinet, which is that subject that I had worked with a little bit before and wanted to do, and you'll see it in the gallery, a much larger piece. But I'm, I find myself really getting angry or frustrated when people have tried to shift that narrative to anti-American or uh, a disrespect to our soldiers or a disrespect to our flag when it's all about truly being an American. And I had to ask myself the question again, and what does that look like to be an American, black American, and to be called out as anti-American simply because you're speaking out against the atrocities that have been committed against us from the very beginning. So that's where the whole series kind of came from. And then I needed to explore that a lot. So I mean, I, I, again, I think the narrative is the same. It's just expanding it uh, a little bit. 
It seems a little more aggressive, um, direct. Um, yeah, you know, a lot I, I of your work was a little soft. Yeah. <laughs> right? with, with the flag, the stars and stripes and everything, there was a, a brief hesitance to kind of address that because, again, the idea of disrespecting the, the flag was in my mind, but realizing, again, what the truth is about that, it just made perfect sense. So it is, it is probably a little bit more aggressive than normal. I agree. And so the color palette has changed. Mm -hmm. Uh, you mentioned the gray scales, right? And with the silent series, the red, the blue, how much, how important was the color to each piece? And I think that's what a big change is. It's like there are artists out there that I truly admire that are, are great colorists, and so looking at the palettes that they use um, always kind of inspired me. And so I play with colors all the time. But in this case, I wanted to pull back the color. I wanted to focus on that story of the red, the white, the blue, and the black. And so initially it was red, white, red, white, black, and gray. But then I introduced the blue. Uh, again, I want to kind of play on the, the, the colors of the American flag. So I pulled back a lot on color. Okay. With color and the message, I'm curious, Onaji, how does that affect your job? And can you share with us all you do? Sure. So um, I'm Onaja Anderson. I um, one of the owners of Zukai Gallery. Um, we specialize in original works by African American artists. And it's funny. I had a conversation with Charlie a while back. We were uh, looking at some of his work, and he was saying, "You know, some of my stuff is seen as controversial to some galleries." And I told him, "I said I, I never even recognized that as being controversial in the conversation we had, because ideally, what we want the gallery to represent is something or a place that is unapologetically." black, unapologetically truthful, but just the idea of just being able to live unapologetically is so important, and so many other groups get to do that. Um, and so to keep uh, narratives honest are important. So for us, the, the narrative is important. So you can't live today and act as if things are not currently happening or things never happened before. And, and they are what shape the lives of the artists. Um, in the lives of the, the patrons and the people who just come visit the gallery. So there's a, there's a way that I, you, you're able to then identify better with a group of people. So this is not only for African Americans, of course, because we get a lot of clients who are of other races who come in, but they also then get a, a perspective that may not be shared at the, the dinner table or may not even be discussed at home. So it allows us to be able to explore some other things. So it doesn't scare collectors away? No, I, I, well, it's funny because a lot of times we've seen in, historically is that the people who have the biggest problem with it is us. Um, in my experience in selling work, a lot of times, you know, I've had clients tell me in the past that, oh, this piece is, uh, it may offend some people, it's too offensive or it's too, too black. Um, but then I'll have a, let's say, a, a white client come in and says, I love it. It could be called Kill Whitey. And they're like, I love that piece. <laughs> And, uh, but, but what I'm saying is that it's, it's, it's sometimes our sensitivity. Um, so in this space, you're dealing with a lot of things. You're dealing with self-hate. You're dealing with uh, a, a shame that's there sometimes that, I mean, rightfully so in certain cases where we've been taught a certain to, to, to see ourselves a certain way. And, and unfortunately, some of us actually believe the things that we're told. So what happens is that when you look at the work, I've had clients tell me, I don't want to offend anybody by putting this in my house. And I'm saying, it's your house. Mm -hmm. So how much control does these narratives or these narratives have over your life to where now you're afraid to even put something up in your own home because you might get a visitor who might be offended by what you put on your wall. And the, and the opposite comes for other collectors. Right. So. And I want to get back to that topic as we get okay. further into this. Um, I mentioned the Kerner Commission 50 years ago, the report that was done that basically said that we were two Americas and um, it talked about the effect, why we had that result, and that result was based on racism, the frustration that black communities were having with the in inequities, with housing, um, incarceration, uh, the disparity with income and health. And some of your works had a message about health. About what? Health. 
I'm sorry. Tell me, tell me well, more. Of them. Not this particular yeah, we, one. We talk a lot, so yeah, sometimes we, we kind of like. But we not this. Coded. Not this okay. particular one, but mm -hmm. oh, health. It, it, okay. it definitely right. plays a role yeah, yeah, in this yeah. work. Yeah. So I want. I want to bring your right. reflection on on that. Well, you know what? It's, it's not even in this exhibit, but right. there's a series I did called uh, Eminent Domain, and Eminent Domain deals with uh, a government law that gives them the right to take property that they deem necessary for growth, whether it's a highway system or whatever that might be. But if you look at the history of eminent domain, it's like 90% black communities. And this is how the highway system was built in this country. And if you look at the history of that, you'll discover that um, it destroyed because it separated and broke up black communities around the country. And so I did a series called Eminent Domain where I took, uh, it was shortly after my mom transitioned, she passed of cancer. And so one day I looked up cancer cells just to see what they looked like. And um, I found like these fascinating looking shapes. And so I wanted to kind of play with that. So what I did was I combined our history, black communities. I combined um, highway systems around the world or around the country. And then I took these cancer cells and I started to paint them on top of the black and white photographs and the highways to kind of represent the government. Uh, so yeah, there are times like, because I, again, that was kind of an outlet. As an artist, we need outlets. You know, like uh, I think a lot of us, unfortunately, don't have outlets. So you, you build this frustration, this anger inside, and you don't know how to let it out. And sometimes it comes out in unhealthy ways. I think fortunately, as an artist, we are allowed to use our art as a vehicle to kind of let go and to release. And I think that was me dealing with the loss of my mom, but also dealing with, like, there are so many historical, like, there's documents out there that are constantly being revealed about, like, redlining and how, yes, it did exist, although it's been denied for a long time. Uh, all the things that have been discussed, I think, in the last week or so about banks and how they were giving out loans and how they were cutting out black people. And we're all sitting back as black people sitting back saying, we know. You know, and the reaction is that yeah, we've known this has been going on, but people are accusing us of, of you know, um, thinking of a conspiracy or something like that when it's now being over and over again proven that this is happening. And so I think, again, as an artist, which is really a great outlet, it's like you look at a situation like that and you can either go literal with a painting or you can interpret it and say, okay, what does it look like without going literal? And I think I talked about that when we did the artist talk. And you know, I had made a decision some time ago when 45 got into office, I would never paint him. But a lot of the work, including that whole silence series, it's based on the anger and frustration I feel towards this man. Right. And there's a lot of themes in this show. And I was curious, and I'm sure some other people are curious. Um, Notorious Big, smoking a blunt. Oh yeah. <laughs> and. Um, how does that fit into this narrative? Um, I think the whole series, because I think the, the, the body of work represents a, a several different series. And the Notorious series has to do with uh, blackness and selling that, celebrating, truly celebrating blackness. So if you look at that piece, and there's a, uh, who was it? Nina, Nina Simone Nina. and James Baldwin, who I've painted many times. I, as, as much as I love James Baldwin as a writer, I've always loved his face, and so I've painted his face many times. But if you notice, if you go back and you look at that, that series, you'll notice that it, even in the case of the two of them, they're lighting a cigarette. And so the cigarette also kind of pays homage to my parents in the early days when they were both smokers. So I'm like, but I want to do go black, as black as possible, so that you're looking at that piece or those pieces from a distance, you see the arrangement of flowers. But as you approach it, you begin to see the image that's underneath it. But that's celebrating blackness, but going really pure with it. Cool. For them, Colin, the size, the scale, talk about that. Um, I've gotten to a point where I just want to work larger. And I've been thinking about that for a long time. How can I explore this on a larger scale? And so because of my, my studio, when I first selected my studio, I picked a, a, a space that had a large wall because I wanted to work larger. And having the opportunity to do a mural a couple of summers ago was when I started to realize and get the confidence knowing that I could work a larger scale. And so because, again, a beautiful dome of his afro, 
I wanted to kind of emphasize that, especially in a larger scale, but also integrate in it the whole idea of why he took a knee. You have some slave pieces, auction pieces. Uh, one in particular, Good Servant. Uh, I recently read a essay by Shelby Still that says, you know, black people are whining. <laughs> in short, um, you know, we're kind of comfortable with being in a position of whining and complaining. And when I saw that image, I don't know if I interpreted it properly, but it was an image that said these two people, it was a woman and a military officer, were happy. Mm -hmm. um, are you saying that? Not at all. Uh, when that, in that series is part of, of advertisement. So I was taking words from um, one ads or posted about runaway slaves or auctions and incorporating new images into, into them. Uh, when I look at, at, at uh, Hattie McDaniel, who's the subject matter, and the other guy escapes me right now, but it really was showing this image that how, how Hollywood has always kind of portrayed us. It's kind of you know, played us as you know, happy Negroes. And so uh, Stephen Fetchin kind of character, exactly. And so it was that kind of like playing with that image. Not exactly. I mean, I mean not really what I'm saying is we're happy. And like, I hear that whole idea of we're complaining. And my first reaction, again, is remembering when I first saw um, I'm Not Your Negro and walking out almost in a rage. Uh, I fortunately, I was, at a, uh, I was at a theater that allowed you to drink. And so, uh, fortunately, I had a couple of glasses of wine. Otherwise, I probably would have been really like angry, because I realized that these things that were quoted were things he'd said 30 years ago. And the reality is that nothing has changed. So um, the idea of one of the things he said to be black or a Negro in America is to always live in a, a certain stage of rage makes some sense. If you're looking, if you're truly looking around, you have many reasons to be angry. But again, as an artist, we can use our art as an expression to release a lot of that, in, that frustration. Okay. In this same essay by Shelby Still, remember that name, y'all. <laughs> uh, he said that black protest was a thing of the 50s and the 60s, and that black people of today didn't know how to protest. They didn't know about the commitment. And he says this at a time when <clears throat> Colin Kaepernick in Black Lives Matter is the face of protests. And do you consider your artwork, specifically this work, protest art? I never thought of it that way. I mean, it's definitely, what I think is really important is to have that conversation and to continue to have that conversation. Um, I think that you're probably going to pose that question to the last panelist, too, to some degree. But um, I'm, I'm looking at it, I think that I have a 14-year-old, and that 14-year-old is conscious, but I want her to always be conscious, to always keep her eyes open. And so we've had that conversation over and over again about a post-racial society, you know, and saying, don't ever buy into that concept. You know, we're always going to be black, and we're always going to be identified and recognized as black and in most cases identified and recognized as black as a negative. And so it's like, no, it's important to celebrate blackness, but also uh, I think a lot of the work is educational. Um, protests, I think the last of the series might be leaning more towards the protest, but in general, I don't look at my work as protest art. Okay. And I wanna ask Rihanna, who is a youth activist, what does protest look like for you? And share with us your experience with protest. Okay, um, ooh, hold on. Um, well, for me, so I go to Georgia Tech. I'm studying industrial engineering there, but I also am a professional dancer and I have a dance company. Um, so first I'll talk about being a student at Georgia Tech and protesting there. Um, so in 2015, no, 2016, I kneeled during the anthem um, following the death of Terrence Crutcher, 
and I kneeled for the rest of the season. I was on the Georgia Tech dance team. Um, and so my type of activism in that way tends to be more on the forefront of things. But at the same time, I feel like my generation, I get, can't really speak for everyone, but um, when it comes to people my age participating in activism, I think that it's really important to recognize that everyone is not going to be like that, like everyone is not going to be the person who wants to kneel during the anthem in order to bring recognition to what's going on in our country. It also requires the people who don't feel comfortable doing that but are doing work behind the scenes. And so I think that sometimes that's misinterpreted as laziness, but rather it's for us, it's almost overwhelming sometimes, especially with like social media. Like if I go on Twitter, it's kind of guaranteed that I'm going to see a video of a black person getting shot by the police. Like that's just going to happen. And so a lot of my reality is like inundated with those images. And so we have to find different ways in order to cope with that while at the same time like dealing with it. And some of the ways that we do that are becoming more, um, I guess like expressive in our blackness, which also can come off as being just negligent towards what's going on in society, but that's not what it means for us. And then as far as my art, as far as making that a social justice act, every um, work that I create, I try to make sure it says something. I don't like empty art or empty dancing. So my last work that I did was a full length production at Georgia Tech and it was called Inhuman. And the idea behind the show was what happens to a people, a place, or a race um, when they're denied their humanity and what that does to the type of art that they create. So basically looking at why hip hop music sounds the way it does versus like classical music based on the history that's come before and also what's coming after. And a lot of times concert dance is considered like if you use music with lyrics, it's considered not real concert dance, which is very like racist in my opinion. So most of the show was done to hip hop music. We had like Kendrick Lamar, um, Kanye West, we had like jazz, some classical music, just basically like getting rid of the idea that black music can't be used in like classical dance and black bodies can't be used on stage to portray a message. And the cast actually was a mixed cast. So we had um, black dancers, but we also had dancers of different races and ethnicities as well, which was really interesting because it required people to go to the place of it being more of an issue about being denied your humanity and being denied the fact that you matter and what that does to you. And it also required the non-black dancers to go to a different place. So even if the audience wasn't touched, which hopefully they were, but even if they weren't, I know that the dancers in the cast at least had to think about that. Um, and so that's always my goal with my art as far as activism is to make sure that people are forced to think, whether it's because they get angry or because they get sad or because they're happy or because they feel like their image is on stage, whatever it is, whatever feeling they have, I want that to then make them think as opposed to doing the reverse where they have to think first and then feel later. I think if you touch into people's feelings, that's really where you can create change. I hope that answered your question. No, okay. that was great. <laughs> <laughs> Onaji, is Arts and activism, the same thing. Do they, do they join? In? Is, is um, activist art and arts activism the same thing? Or are they something different? Um, I think uh, Nina Simone had a piece on Netflix where she talked about this. And she was saying, if you are an artist and you're not using your artwork to reflect the times as a form of activism, if need be, then for that time you're not an artist. That's, now that's, that was her perspective on it. Um, I think that when it comes to arts and activism, um, I think they go hand in hand. If you're if you're telling the truth about where you are, your position, your life, I think it's kind of hard to. What you see in a lot of work that uh, we 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 represent in, in the gallery is reflections of real lives. So it's not like the type of thing where I'm just pandering to whatever's a new topic, these are things that are actual real. So if you're speaking out against them, the beauty about art is that, and I just had this talk uh, recently, at a, we did a corporate talk last month, and the conversation around art and around what it can do and how it can convey messages. The greatest thing about art is the fact that it's one of the last few places where you can actually have an opinion where no one can say anything back to it. Now you can sit back and disagree with everything he has on the wall, and you can yell at it, and it's not gonna reply. 
And the greatest thing about that, though, is that it's out in the world and it's doing something. So it can live far longer. It doesn't need anything other than someone to just stop and pay attention to it for a brief second. It can change people's ideas, thoughts. A performance can do the exact same thing. The arts can just do that. So I think activism in general, when we think about it, although we see pictures of uh, the civil rights movement a lot and how it worked back then, I think what happens is now things will change. You know, young people are the reason why many of the uh, revolutions that we've seen have started. They've been catalysts for all of them. So it's, I think it's dependent upon the time. Um, I think arts will always be part of it, though. Um, there's always a soundtrack to every single revolution ever. You can play something, and uh, from the Vietnam War to the Civil Rights Movement to now. And so I think that, that there is a, for many artists, there is no separation. But I, I do think that um, in the space that we're in now, we're seeing more artists who may have even been more fearful to say things in the past are finding their voice through the arts. Okay. And Tracy, do you find that is true in your work as well? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, as an artist in my work, my focus is on celebrating the female form. So um, my source images are black women. Um, and they're stripped down to their, their, their barest element, which is line and color. And I play with color. And it always it, um, it tickles me when someone comes in and, and would recognize the blackness in them. You know, so my statement is always that we're all human. But I do want you to recognize that this is what we bring to humanity as uh, black women in, in, in this particular time. But it's also, I'm always focused on making sure it's the truth. And I think um, that's what art does and that's what activism does, you know. It's like it's telling the truth of the times. And whether somebody wants to be actively engaged in telling it loudly or softly, but it's the telling the truth part that ties it all together. And Charlie, are you an activist? Um, I, don't, I don't see myself as an activist. I see myself as an artist. Um, but I do feel, as an artist, an obligation to tell the truth. You know, uh, I, don't, I, I like beautiful art. But more importantly to me, as an artist, I need to express uh, my concerns, my fears, my joys, my everything. But again, going back to the idea of acknowledging blackness. Uh, but it's not a conscious, like if someone was to call me an art activist, I mean, I, I, I would receive that, but that's not uh, my intention. Okay, so being an artist aside, as a man, are you an activist? Right. Say that question again. If you throw these, these hard questions in, I'm like, okay, I got to think about it for a little bit. Art aside, mm -hmm. are you an activist? Oh, that's an easy one. I'm sorry. No, no I'm not. Uh, I can probably say that with a, a certain amount of embarrassment uh, because I know that when it comes to the things that I see that I'm against, concerned about, I, my outlet is my art. I don't uh, take picket signs and march or anything like that. Uh, I, I don't. And so uh, I, I recognize that it is the, my art is the expression. So um, divided states, it, it uh, made me think about a lot of things on a broader context, in the broader context, um, when I think about the country that we live in. But it also brought the idea of us being divided within our community um, to mine. Um, any thoughts on that for you? Um, if you look at, I mean, I actually have t-shirts. I think I have a logo and everything like that. Uh, some people might read the US as US, like US of A, but it really is us and them. And so that is addressing the idea that there are those that believe and recognize that there is a struggle and those that don't. And so I think that's what the us, and, us and them is all about. And so divided states is very much about a di divided consciousness, a, a divided awareness. 
Uh, and so it's not all race, but I think a majority of it is race. Um, one of the things uh, in the community that I find that we're divided on is colorism. That's been a, a conversation. It surfaced recently, and um, I wanted to ask Mario, um, as a Afro-Latino, um, is that a, aside from your blackness? Um, I don't necessarily. Hi, I'm the poet. <laughs> um, I don't necessarily think it's aside from it. I think it just adds another layer of, um, it's another ingredient in an already brewing stew. Um, I have my children here and we come and we have conversations all the time considering their mother's black and I'm Puerto Rican and they ask like what are they and I happily tell them they're both like and being one is not exclusive of the other they one is indicative there's no way around that and from a personal perspective like I've had family in Puerto Rico that I've had conversations with that I realized were racist However, when I did my DNA swab, it said I was 56% Mozambican. So if you know your history and you don't allow these colonizers to whitewash you, you have no choice but to accept the fact that these are all the beautiful hues of you in every aspect. So me saying I'm Puerto Rican, I just feel like that just means that I add a little more sazon in my dish hey. than you guys do. <laughs> Thank you for that insight. Um, another thing that I find we're divisive on is uh, whether we can actually be activists and enjoy some things at the same time. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> hey, jump in. Okay. I mean, jump is in. That, is that the end of the question? Um, well, it's more of a statement, not a question. Um, but I definitely want to talk about that, okay. um, especially like with the Black Panther movie. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, that's just something I'm really interested in, especially when it comes to hip hop music and trap music. Because a lot of times people say to people my age, like, oh, you guys don't know you're listening to trap music. Like, that's not social justice at all. Um, but I actually had the like, pleasure of taking a trap music class at Georgia Tech. Um, just like the coolest class I've ever taken in my entire life with Dr. Joycelyn Wilson and she actually has her PhD studying like hip-hop and how it relates to history and technology and basically we studied all of outcast music and different trap music that comes out of Atlanta and we looked at how trap music is actually a social justice act and how from the origins of hip-hop so hip-hop started with like DJing breaking all that stuff and so what happened is in this, a lot of the black schools, they took away the music programs because funding was low, but they just wanted to take away the music programs. And so then kids started making their own beats and making music with the records. And so that's where DJing came from. And then you have MCing that comes out of that. But all of that came out of parties. Like all of this stuff came out of party scenes and to me, I had a piece in my show about this actually, um, it's this idea that partying is in fact a social justice act because, and that's why when you were saying you don't think of yourself as an activist, you think of yourself more as an artist, but you're trying to tell your story, I think that that in itself is also an act of social justice because you're claiming that my truth matters, therefore I can put it out there and that's what it is. Um, and there's a movie, oh, and it don't stop and it's about graffiti and graffiti in New York and it's crazy because the movie was filmed I think in like the 70s or the 80s but one of the kids they're asking him why he tags trains and he was like I don't know I just want to show that I'm here that I matter like I'm trying to say that that's it and it's crazy because now the whole thing is black lives matter and so in that way if you relate this back to I guess European history with the Victorian Revolution when they started making, I think it was the World's Fair, they made it cheap enough for people who were working class to also go to the World's Fair. And so people who were higher class, they got really upset because they were like, no, the working class, they need to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. They can't relax at all. They need to be working harder. But it's this idea that I also deserve to have a good time. And in that way, 
it's social justice because you're saying like I'm on the same level as you I can go out and party and then deal with everything else later like a couple hours later that's fine and so I think that it's hard sometimes to always be an activist and activist like I'm protesting black power all the time and sometimes you have to recharge but that recharge itself is like it means something at the same time if that makes sense future Hendrix hmm? future Hendrix yes <laughs> exactly <laughs> Um, you want to add anything to that? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I, I think it's important to also say that we're using this, this term of activism, but we think about it, or we're, we're mentioning it in the stance of uh, marches, and activism is far more than just that. Like, yeah. you, you going, you know, you, you, you having a corporate job, uh, getting uh, promoted and making sure people like you get promoted as well exactly. is activism. Um, there are so many different types of ways that you, you, you just, it's really about standing up for you and your people um, at the end of the day. And, and whichever format you choose to do that with, I think what, what happens sometimes is that it's not necessarily recognized the same way or respected the same way, and that's the problem. Um, I think for even with um, what what happens even in the gallery or what, what you see in, in corporate America, a lot of times, if it's not in your face, people don't recognize the amount of time you may have de dedicated to whatever you're doing and uh, the excellence you have in your field. And you may have worked your entire life just so you can get to this VP or president or CEO position so you could create a pipeline all the way back down. But the entire time you're doing it, you're being criticized by everybody who looks just like you. Mm -hmm. So you just never know what someone's end game is. Um, so I think it's important to mention that while we talk about this because the thing we never talk about is the fact that all the things we say we want, it needs funding. So a lot of times you meet a lot of people who have great ideas and no money. The problem with that then is that those ideas never get executed. So you need people who are activists in different ways. Like you might just be a funder <laughs> and that's needed as well. But all these things are needed. So. I want to add on to that because um, there's, a, I think there's a movie that's out about Rosa Parks um, that's coming out uh, very soon. But one of the intriguing parts about it is that it explores what's behind a movement and oh, yeah. who are the people that's behind the movement and behind anything that happens. You know, there are, there there are those who are cooking the dinners, they're saying like, I got the kids, you do this, mm -hmm. or I'm gonna make this, um, you know, there's a conscious decision, there's an, an intention behind to support a movement. And we don't really see all of that, all we see is what, what the media puts out. So those different forms of activism happen all the time, the different layers of it, you know, it's just not highlighted all the time. So I called Charlie, and I think I, I said you were a soft activist one time. <laughs> and he was like, can we not use the word soft? And, and, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, but I, that's how I see your work, because you know we have all these, these conversations, and our conversations are about blackness, and our people, and you know even um, just all of our conversations about how are we going to, um, how are we doing our part to uplift, to, to make things better. Because what we want, we want to make things better. We want, we see the inequity, because we're living the inequity on all, in, in, in all forms of our lives. But what are we actively doing to, to kind of play our part so that we're, we're, we're close to an equity position, that we're making there's an equity position in there. So I still haven't found the right word for it. To, but but you're, you're silent. <laughs> so I, I, I'm, 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 I'm taking out soft because yeah. you, you, you're so offended by me using that word. But it's not, you know, and, and passive is not it because passive is not the word for it. Mm -hmm. But you, you know, our conversations are very dynamic and they're all about support within our community. And there's a lot of humor that goes on with it, like, mm, yeah, these black folks over here are doing this, and but we're having a conversation on how we're going to, or what our part is on, on, on making things better. You're very engaged in reaching down and working with the, the next generation. Is, is it that um, you just don't want to be associated with the word activist? 
<laughs> because I see you, as Tracy said, I see you engage. Mm -hmm. you, you definitely um, pull people up from the curbside and give information. You're out there with the children. You did the program in Alabama, the arts program, right. with the children. And um, is it that you just see it differently? Um, as this, those type of um, initiatives are your duty to you the village? I, you know what? The responsibility. You know, I, I, it's, I don't think I'm doing anything special. Uh, I don't think I'm speaking out or stepping out in a way to bring any kind of attention to myself. You know, if these art shows, for example, could work without me being there, I would not be there uh, because I'm an artist. And so I, I uh, and that's what I want to focus my energy on, is just creating. Um, but if I was given a platform, the platform would always be the same. It would be about that celebration, that acknowledgement, the recognition of blackness. So, but I've never thought about it, but I'm, even with what Anaji said, the idea that there's a subtlety to it at times, mm -hmm. but there's a, always, an ongoing consciousness about it. You know, um, and we hadn't even talked about it. We talked about an artist talk, but my, my awareness, like once I got involved with doing children's books, my commitment was black children books. And my agent came back and said, I got this book for you. Like, it's a black children. And she says, no, I, I don't want it. And so it's that kind of consciousness, that awareness, that I want to make a difference. It's a mm -hmm. conscious decision. When I'm gone, um, I want to know that I've uplifted, inspired, helped other black folk. So that's my commitment. And it's a form of activism. OK. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like we're having an intervention here. <laughs> Own, own your activism. Own your <laughs> activism. Yeah. Um, you had a piece out there um, that caught my eye. It's about love, black love. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't really tell like what I felt about it. And I wanted, was hoping that you could give me a, more insight on it. Um, I was working on a series on the um, advertisement for slave auctions. and. Uh, the also the ones for runaway slaves. And I had already put the images in before, and I put the type in about runaway slave or uh, slave auction. And I came back to it one day because it felt like I had created a piece or two that was beginning, it was beginning to be a felt redundant. <coughs> so then I'm like, let me go back to it and change this, and change the narrative. Let me celebrate, acknowledge black love. And so that's kind of like, especially looking at those two people, in that figure, uh, there was an embrace there, there was strength there, there was you know, that, that having someone's back. And so I wanted to make that statement, so I scratched it out in an obvious sort of way so you could see I'm covering it up and I'm replacing it with this word because I want to acknowledge the thing that we don't hear enough about, and that is black love. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that um, as a sort of resolve, and especially when I think about your show divided states and then the arts industry um, and the relationship between men and women, right? And whether that is something that needs to be worked on and kind of paying attention to, to some of the fractures. Um, like for instance, we have a movie like Black Panther. It was very anticipated. Um, definitely celebrated for the men and women in the show, but the center was the superheroes and uh, the protagonists and the antagonists. And then we have A Wrinkle in Time coming out and a full woman cast. Um, and we didn't have the same rally behind that. And when I look at the artwork, the art world, it is dominated by men. And I'm curious about why that is. Um, there's, I did some study a few days ago, and there are 51, the ratio for women artists and men artists is 51% women artists. Yeah. 77% um, of the men artists are they make their living doing arts. Only 20%, 27% of that are women, and they're not necessarily artists, but they have some sort of role in arts, whether it's a curator, director, gallerist. And so 
I want Onaji, Charlie Yu, and Tracy to just give me some sort of um, idea, insight, or reflection on what it is that women are not bringing to the table and why there's a lack of representation um, on the gallery side, um, in the museum side, inclusion with you know museum collections and what we can do about that. So I'm gonna try this. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I think part of uh, part of this discussion a lot of times is that we look at these percentages a lot of times. Are we talking about we get into this this broader percentage numbers and, and, and looking at it as a whole, but we start looking at marginalization of just black people. In general. I would love to know the percentage of just us in general because none of us are in museums. The people who actually really make a living off that is not 77 percent of, of African American right. artists. Yeah. And so, while I can't speak for that that system that that they're part of, I can speak to some things that we we recognize in regards to even how we encourage our our children. So a little boy draws, little girl draws. At some point, sometimes creativity is not necessarily. Um, encouraged as much with little girls. Now we, we are currently looking for more women artists now. Uh, and we've been looking for years for more and more women artists even in the gallery. But at the same time, I'm an engineer. Now there was young ladies who were extremely smart, of course, just as smart as I was, but maybe at 14, 15, maybe they were steered outside of engineering or science and maths in general. And, and get more into other, other areas. But my, my point in all of this is that a lot of it starts in how we encourage our children and, and what boundaries we sometimes put on our children uh, at a young age and how we encourage them to create and continue to create. The other piece of it is when it comes to um, what, it's, it's always funny to me because when we have these conversations, it's like we, in our circle, none of us are winning yet if that makes sense. So it's like we have this conversation inside of a, a larger conversation where it's almost like, well, we're talking about crumbs on either side where, let's say, for example, somebody says, African-American artists are doing, they're doing great. How much are their paintings selling for? 100,000, maybe, who are living, living African-American artists, right? Male or female? White artists who are living, how much are, is our art selling for? So you have, you have Damien Hurst, for example, who's worth, what, half a billion? A small tin of uh, uh, a tin sculpture of an artist may go for 20 million and sell. But you have artists like Charlie or like Tracy who've been painting for years and working for years, and they get that $20,000 mark, and everybody's like, wow, they did it. You see what I'm saying? So that's why the, the, the question is, is, is a little bit more compacted, I think. Um, than not. I know what at the gallery we do, even with my nieces and with, um, with the filters that we do in, in, in the gallery, we always have uh, uh, students come in and, and, and some of the young women will come in and they'll say stuff like, you know, I used to draw. And our question is, why'd you stop? And they'll say something, well, you know, uh, either it's not encouraged or it's, it's, um, it's, it's one of those type of things where we just don't see it the same way, unfortunately. It's the same way with, like I said, with math and science. A lot of the, the STEM or STEAM that, it, that it's, it is now, it's just not encouraged for some reason. Um, so I think a lot of it starts early on, and, and it's how we encourage our young people at an early age to, to continue to push them out. Because honestly, there are not a lot of fields, I mean, a lot of, it's not, right now, the bigger problem in our community for African Americans is this level of support from the community. Like, how many people are actually collecting original works of art, period? How many African-American art galleries are there? So you think of, this is Atlanta, the blackest city in America. There are, what, two or three African-American art galleries here that specialize in, in, in original works by African-American artists? So if you, if you the blackest city in America, and then if, you, if you start really hopping around, you start counting the number of African-American galleries in the country, there are not many. So that's what I'm saying. Sort of, so the question is kind of, it's a difficult one to answer because it's not even a lot of outlets for those professional artists in general. Uh, but, but they're there. No, they, they're, they are there. Even within um, our community, there is still a stark difference between the woman artists right. and you know, their visibility versus. And what I'm saying is that, so even. Huh? It's patriarchy. Oh, 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 oh,
Only definitely that. What I'm saying, I'm saying, but, but as far as what we see, even down to submissions and everything else, we don't see it on our side from a business standpoint. So it's not like we're denying it. I'm saying we don't even see it. So I'm saying it's somewhere it's happening even prior to. Right. It's the point I'm making. Okay. Tracy? Well, I can add to that. So in my family, um, I have artists that are like world renowned um, and uh, male. Uh, the female artists are not as well uh, as, as renowned. Um, and so I was always a creative child, um, but when I went to college, I went to college for pre-med because it was like, oh yes, a doctor was an acceptable occupation, occupation to my parents for me, and I, I thought I, that I wanted to be a doctor. And the creative thing, even though I, was always, I grew up with art, it wasn't, as a, as a, um, it wasn't encouraged as this is how you would earn your living. So I get into to college on pre-med and realize I don't like being around sick people enough to actually go to medical school. And it's like my junior year when I tell my mom that I've been taking art classes and theater classes and I want to change my major, I'm thinking about changing my major. And my mother was like, you have one more year that we're paying for college. So uh, you may not be going to pre-med, but you're gonna graduate with a degree. So you work that out, you let us know. And so I graduated with a psychology degree that I use every day, but I don't make my living for that. So my path to being um, an artist, and I'm still working to being a full-time artist, like this right here is my hero here, like when he does this, he paints every single solitary day. And then he looks at me like, you're painting today or are you working on a project today? You know, and so he's helping, me, leading me into that path, but it's, it's a complicated path. Um, the role models that are out there for artists, female artists that are making their living solely in, uh, on their creations are, are, that, are, that are women of color is far and few between. You have the dynamics of the whole art world that only gonna live one or, let one or two dots us uh, you know, be at that level where we can uh, command you know, million dollars, you know, for our work. You know, you have Kara Walker, and now you have, you know, some others that are up there. But, you know, it's a, the spots that are up there for those th that are opening the doors, they're few and far between. And then for them to, their work to be, uh, to actually be shown to collectors who are going to pay that kind of money is actually in the hands of white galleries, right. you know? So it's a real complex, insidious, um, kind of issue that, is, it, that, that there's no easy button to solve it, but it does start with nurturing the child who, who shows an interest and an aptitude for creativity and encouraging them that go forward and we're gonna support you. You know, and my parents were very clear. They're like, yeah, your Uncle Elton's doing really, really, really well. He travels around the world, he does that, you know. But, however, <laughs> You like medicine, right? You, yeah, yeah. We we want you to be a doctor, and I was like, right. okay, I give it a try. Yeah, it was great. Sean, um, turn my mic off. Um, I, I think I, you're saying the same thing, though. I think it's important <clears throat> when you think about females. Uh, first, I don't think they're often taken seriously. It's a hobby, um, but I think it's also important to do this as a living to have a strong support system. And too often, like women are operating on their own, and there are children involved. And so, where is their support system to allow them to pursue it more seriously? But we've had, like, because like, I talked to Anaji about it as well as Lauren when they were looking at trying to put together and bring in more female artists. It's very difficult to find the ones that are not already up up there. The the ones that are already successful and they got their gallery representation and they're doing it. It's hard to find those that you see the potential in. Uh, but we, again, we know they're there, but especially in our community, do we take female artists seriously enough to acknowledge them and push them forward? And I think mentorship is something that I do, <clears throat> excuse me, so I really ask the question, how serious are you about it? And if you're really serious, I'm gonna do what I can to kind of help to encourage it. But I mean, we know they're there, but again, are they being taken serious? Can I add something? Okay. I think it's Absolutely. also important that we change the language that we use when we're talking about women entering spaces in art, um, because I think, 
I know it wasn't intentional, but when you phrased the question, you said, what aren't women bringing to the table? And I think that kind of puts it on the women as it's their fault. I know that's not what you were saying, but I think it's important that we always like consciously think about that, like how we phrase those things. Um, we were talking about this in my psychology class the other day, that like you were saying, it's like, in, it's the responsibility of the gallerist and the people who have the ability to support these people to let them know that they have that support system behind them. So we just have to like make sure that we use the correct language. <laughs> um, I learned a lot. I learned a lot uh, from this, this show, Divided States. It definitely made me think about all of the things that um, are fractured within blackness and what have you, you learned producing this work? She always hits me with the hard questions. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't know if I learned anything from the show. I think what I learned um, over at Zucat, they bring in a group of students, at least a group, a couple of buses twice a month. And so I'll go over there and I, when I give an opportunity to speak to them. Um, I love it because I love being able to share and encourage them, let them know there are other options, especially if you got the talent and the des desire. And I learned something and a really good question asked one day over there where a young lady asked, do you cater your work to your audience? And when you're talking about your art, do you cater it to your audience? Meaning that if the audience is majority white, do you say it, do you present yourself differently? And uh, I thought, like from a 16-year-old, it was a very deep question. And so I think we talk about that. In fact, I think we had a, a show on, on apo unapologetic. And it's like, I have to be in a, that position to not apologize for my blackness. Uh, so that's where I'm going right now. I'm going and continuing to go in this idea. Yeah, I, I know as a full-time artist, you know, like in anything we talk about investment, you talk about multiple streams of income. I don't make all my money just doing the political work or the social work, I, social images. Uh, I do other images that I know appeal to a lot of large audience, but it's more commercial. It's more in children's books or a commission piece that might come from a corporation. Uh, but in the end, it's like I won't apologize and I won't cater my work to the audience because I'm convinced as an artist that what I create, everything I create is for someone. I just kind of get a broader, people more aware of what I'm doing and they'll find me. And piggybacking off what Rihanna said, um, as a resolve, mm -hmm. changing the language and being mindful of the language, and this question is for all of you as I close and open the floor for questions for the, from the audience, is how can we not be divided? You got time. You got time. Who wants to do it? Um, uh, okay. <laughs> well, like I said before, a lot of my work, I realize fairly recently what I want to focus on, and I think it's combating the dehumanization of black people and people of color. Pretty sure that's what I'm going to be focusing on. Um, and I think from my perspective, as far as what I'm going to try to do to not be divided is really show people through like dance and shows and productions that we're not so different as we're not as polarized as we think we are. We get so ingrained in the differences between us, even like me being younger than everybody else on the panel. It's like, oh, well, I'm the young person. Huh? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but we get so polarized. We think that our differences make us so different, whereas in actuality, our differences are what make us a lot of the ways similar, um, because we have similar intersections that go on with all of us. And so I think the best way for us to not be divided is to really make it each of our goals to recognize the humanity in other people, no matter what, if they have a different opinion from you or if they look different from you. And not in a way that is like, oh, I'm colorblind. I don't, I hate that. I will say they're colorblind, because that, denies my entire existence as a black woman if you say you're colorblind. Like my experiences are completely different than a white woman. But at the same time, if you can acknowledge those differences and embrace them and then try to learn from other people because of those differences, I think that's the best way to create conglomeration. Onaji. 
Uh, not to be negative, but I don't necessarily think it's, it's possible. Um, I think, uh, I think the, vision, the division that we face now was not our, we're not the mastermind of that. And I think things that are put in place currently that will continue to be in place are these, I'm waiting for like the, we talked about this actually, how in, in, in music when uh, Public Enemy had Fight the Power, all of a sudden, gangster rap was introduced. And it changed the entire way of where people were in African medallions, they were doing a little bit more interest in, in what, about us and everything else, and then something kills it. So I'm waiting for this next wave. But what I, what I guess what I want to say is that there's a machine that's out there, right? I think that from a personal activism standpoint, you can do things like you can support what is around you. Uh, and I think like these, these broad um, ideas are great, but I think what's practical is saying, okay, so I can either go buy this, um, this suit off the rack that is by this designer here, or I can go support this tailor, this black tailor who can make the exact same thing for me. Right. Or for the same price or less. Or, or less. Or more. Or more, or, exactly. Or, more. or if you got it, yeah. <laughs> but, but my point is that it, it begins with just support in general, uh, support of each other. So, because you know, once again, the vision piece is, it's division inside our own communities, and then, then the sex, it just continues going on and on and on. So what I would say is begin to, to deal with what's right around you and what's at home, and then work from there. Um, because honestly, these problems, these problems have existed, especially in the United States, from the very beginning. So the idea that we're gonna stop this machine, what we can do is uh, support one another um, way more than we currently do. I agree. Tracy? Uh, for me, um, I've always been of the, uh, I'll say this. I was introduced to a collaborative art environment through Louis Delsart. And he was working on a 25 foot mural and he invited artists from the community to work on, uh, to, to work on it. And it was like, it just went out. Uh, I just, it was on Facebook or something like that. And I was like, ooh, I never worked on a mural before. This would be cool. And so not even knowing who Lewis was or the magnitude of this project. And his humbleness, um, he's a very gracious, humble individual. And he, he, I just showed up. And I was like, hey, um, I said I could help work on this. I worked on panel number 25. And he gave me my little area. And I learned from him that I didn't have to create by myself. And it changed how I, how I approached my creativity and how I approached doing art. So I'm playing that forward in every opportunity that I have to share something with another artist, um, for them to get paid, for them to work on projects that help them grow. That's how I, I, that's how I live my life. I'm, I'm living how I was taught to do it. And um, it's always been an inclusion. And sometimes I've been burned. There's times where I was like going, oh wow, boo, I'm not gonna be able to work with you again because <laughs> you're not ready. But I did give you the opportunity. You did learn from it. I learned from it, certainly. Um, and I'm very intentional on making sure that I, when, when, when something, when there's a way for me to support, I make sure that I support us as much as possible. Palmer. Um, I'm going back to probably where I was 10 years ago, and that is, uh, it's a shift in vibration. It is uh, an openness and a willingness and a willingness to love and be vulnerable. I think that um, too often, especially when, in this environment, like hatred and anger and divi the, the divisiveness and these actions are only separating us and we're buying into it. Uh, turn off the TV set, stop watching the news because it's not going to lift you or encourage you or inspire you. You have to kind of, you kind of have to cut it all out and make a decision because that's, that's contamination. And what we need to do is to give, change that vibration and give love. And so I think that if anything, it's, it's, it's trying to work through lowering these walls, of my walls, and letting people in in a way that I can say, if there's something I can do to help you. And I like the idea. I've always been about trying to pass it forward. 
that is my reward. And, and, and I know that we're kind of at a point now where we're looking at people who even want to assist, and you're wondering what's in it for them or what's the motivation. Well, my, my motivation is to pass it forward. My motivation is to inspire. My motivation is to try to find those people that are truly loving, that are willing to give and willing to share with, with that being the reward. And I think that makes a real big difference. So I think I'm at this place of love. And we appreciate you. And we appreciate you for this activism uh, that you did <laughs> today, you know, with uh, bringing us all together to have this conversation. And I think um, that's a fundamental part is to continue to have these conversations. And I think that helps us to be undivided. I don't want to go. I'm sorry, I had, I had a question. One of the reasons I wanted you on this panel. <laughs> Okay. I wanted to, I mean, I'm, I, I examined, I've, I've had a conversation with another friend of mine who had a daughter that was in high school. Mm -hmm. and it was a private school of 90% white. Yeah. And she chose uh, two years ago to not stand for the Pledge of Allegiance in protest. And I asked her, as I'm asking you, uh, really, like, because I know I wouldn't have had the courage to do that. Where did that come from, and what did it feel like? That's really important to me. Okay. I want to know how um, that happened. So I found out about, so I've been following Colin Kaepernick's protests for a while, um, pretty much since he started. Um, and then I found out about Terrence Crutcher's death. I think he was killed on a Thursday, and the game was on a Saturday. And for me, that was like the last straw. If there was another last straw, that was the last, last straw. Um, so I texted my coach and I told her I was going to kneel and I sent her, and my coach is a white woman, and I sent her um, like links to news articles and I was like, this is what's going on, this is why I'm going to kneel, just so you know in advance. Like I'm not asking for permission, I'm just letting you know. Um, and so then she called me immediately. <laughs> Um, exactly. <laughs> but we had a, a talk on the phone about it and I'm really lucky because she was very supportive and she understood that she couldn't understand what I was feeling or why I felt the need to do this, but she connected me with um, a black woman named Markeisha who worked in the Athletic Association PR team so that no matter what happened, if I got any weird stuff from the media, I had someone I could talk to. So that was very helpful. Um, but I was still like scared, like, oh my gosh, I was so nervous. So Saturday came, and before the games, we did this thing called pregame, which is where it's like we march on the field with the band. It's very simple. We do simple arms. I'm a professional ballerina, so that stuff is pretty easy for me. I messed up everything. Like, oh my god, I looked a mess. Because I was so nervous, because all that happens before the anthem. And then it was time for the anthem, and I knew I was going to do it. But then I looked over to the free, the free student section is where all the black students sit because we don't buy the paid tickets. Um, but there was a tail, <laughs> so we call it the black student section. But there was a tailgate that day, so nobody was there. So it was just me in a stadium full of a lot of white people. And my parents normally come to every game, but they weren't there yet because they were in traffic. So I was like, oh my gosh, like people are going to run down and attack me. I don't know what's going to happen. But I still knew that that was what I wanted to do. Um, so to ground myself, I started saying the names of people who had been killed by police brutality um, all the way from, um, why can't I think of his name right now? Huh? Yeah, Trayvon Martin, but oh, why is his name escaping me? Oh. Emmett Till, yes, thank you. All the way from Emmett Till up to Terrence Crutcher. And I, th I think I was crying too when I was kneeling, but that's kind of what I just repeated to myself in my head while I was kneeling. Um, and then I also thought about like the people who participated in sit-ins and the people who did these rallies in the 60s where they were shot at by water hoses and there were dogs. And I'm like, this isn't that bad. I can do this to bring awareness to this thing and like it's going to be fine. So, <laughs> um, so that's, that's kind of what I was feeling. And then after it was over, I was very relieved. But I was also still nervous because Football games, you can't really hear what people are saying. There's just a lot of yelling. Um, and the second half of the game, we have to go to the side where all the white fraternities are because they buy out sections. So the game was really nerve-wracking for me. And then after the game, I remember I was leaving and I had to walk to my car. And this like old white couple came up to me and they were like, excuse me, excuse me, and trying to flag me down. I was like, oh 
no, this is going to be horrible. And they were like, we just love you as a dancer. Can we take your picture? And I was like, oh, yes, OK. <laughs> um, but it was it's very nerve wracking. I think I kneeled for the rest of the season. So I didn't just kneel that game. I kneeled for the rest of the season. And I had, like, they called me into the dean's office once. And I had different meetings with the coaches. Um, so it caused a little bit of rabble at Georgia Tech. Um, and I didn't get kicked off. The t a lot of people think I got kicked off the team, but I had to quit because I had a hip injury. So I didn't get kicked off the team or anything, and there was no animosity between me and my teammates. And I think the more I did it, the easier it got, just because, but every time I still had to ground myself in like why I was doing it, and that kind of helped a lot, so, yeah. We should all have that kind of courage. <laughs> I want to bring to the stage Mario Reyes again, and he has a, a Final word for us before we uh, get to your questions. You want the mic? I don't need it. <laughs> Can y'all hear me over here, Fire? Yeah. Outstanding. So I want to thank you to this conversation about the divided states. Um, I love the question that, that she ended off with on how we could uh, heal. And I've spent, I'm a Puerto Rican kid from the Bronx, spent six years in the military. And every step of that journey, I had to try to convey why I embody what they can never understand, a brown person who identifies as black. Evidently, New York is a very poor baseline for race relations in America, especially when you get to Mississippi. That was funny to me, too. <laughs> um, so, I want to share a piece that I wrote one time when I was leaving the bank after the Trayvon Martin uh, tragedy, and I had my now 10-year-old son, he was about uh, five or six at the time, and we walked out of a local bank and it said there was a, a black artist that turned his building into a piece of art, and it said, America stop killing black men. And he turned to me with those big eyes of his and just asked, Daddy, why do they want to do that? So I had to try to make that make sense for him. And as an artist, I always use reality as my muse. It's hard to speak about race without sounding whiny. No matter the time and place, it always seems untimely. Now I would like to borrow the ear of one of my peers, but the same point of view may only further blind me. Now I would like to speak to somebody white, but at times they come across kind of high and mighty. And my pride and height won't let anybody address me as if I'm tiny. The conversation typically goes like this. Why do black people do X, Y, and Z? So this part is me. It's because of A, B, and C. Now this part is them again. Well, Mario, you're not black, so why do you care? So if it takes one drop of blood to make you black, I ask how long ago did it take for that blessing to be shared? Because according to the census, Puerto Rican isn't a race. That is an ethnicity. So for the sake of their survey, the complexities of my people are met with simplicity. I try to get them to listen to me. But when you try to explain history to the victor, that only comes across as self-pity, or rather pitifully. So I try my best to personalize the conversation and give them some level of insight to my race relation. Hispanic and Haitian, Italians, Irish, Jamaican. Now these are the cultures that I came of age with. And we were growing up, it was all the same thing. But now it seems as if the world has gone mad. Trying to understand this matrix in the absence of imagination. They tag haves as favorites, have nots as jaded, hashtag trending topics on Facebook, as if that is the true face of our nation. Basically, those morals that I was raised with transcend this conversation. I try to remain patient while facing such a subtle discrimination, but some of it is a little more over. Some of y'all might think this fight is over, but the scent of bigotry for me has been a well-known odor. They tell you not to trespass on private property, on stolen land. That has to be the definition of hypocrisy. Now, I never claim to be Socrates, but by accepting black culture within my life, my beautiful children have become a self-fulfilled prophecy. You see, as a father to a son, I'm tasked to raise a man. 
I learned a lot from my dad, but the task at hand, he might not understand. Because I am a Puerto Rican that must raise a strong black man. But for all of you who truly understand, there's no color blame. Virtues are transparent. And no matter how much he can't stand it, one day he'll appreciate having both of his parents. No person is an island, because every man is a planet. And the two cultures that converge in his soul speak the same language. I hope to communicate historical anger while remaining sanguine and let him know that day in and day out it won't be the same thing. So the fight needs to be adjusted. The conversations had in private are very different than those had in public. I say, Bobby, cover for your ideals. Because unfortunately, not even good judgment can guarantee you justice.